guest tonight is an incredible woman, Andrea Magni, business executive, executive coach, and life coach. Today, we talk about dealing with what we are going through currently in the world, coping, developing self-love and coping skills. We discuss vision boards, planning for what our lives were and what we would like them to be. We also talk about the spike in the consumption of alcohol and alcoholism that has risen during this time or the prevalence of alcohol and alcoholism in our society. This is quite a long show, but uh, we touch on some pretty cool things. And uh, the conversation starts with the self-love and self-care around about the 24-minute mark. So if you would like to jump to that or give the whole show a listen, it's something that we definitely believe will, will help you guys. My name is Nicholas Ingle. I am an alcoholic. I am the host of the You Can't Handle the Omet podcast. And today's show is proudly brought to you, and I'm sponsoring this one ourselves because it means a lot to me, by Emmett Gyms. So I'd like to firstly start off the show by welcoming Andrea. Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm well. I'm melting. It is so hot because I'm on the other side of the world from you. Yep. But today is the solstice. So in South Africa, it's the winter solstice. So from tomorrow, you can all be excited. The days will get longer. And the opposite happens for me. But in the meantime, I might just melt. So I've got a lot yep. of water around me and I'm ready for Yeah. How, how many glasses of ice? Two glasses with uh, five giant ice cubes in. Fantastic. And then we're sitting here freezing. And uh, yep. So that's uh, how to make friends in South Africa. But you, you are actually ex South Africa. Well, formerly South African. Uh, what's the correct title? I'm still South African. I'm okay, still yes. South African and very passionate about South Africa. Um, just because I live somewhere else doesn't mean I've forgotten who I, who I am and where my tribe lives. Absolutely. Awesome. So can you tell our listeners and viewers a little bit about you? So dropping you in the deep end. Drop me in the deep end. Um, so I think I'm going to speak specifically around how we came to have this conversation and why, I'm, why you've, been invi- you've invited me to this. Is that I am a survivor. I mean, one of, one of the people that I know um, talks often about the fact that everyone is a survivor because if you're standing here today, you're a survivor. You've survived everything in your life at this point. Love but um, my specific journey is through breast cancer and... Um, I mean, my mom had it, we lost her, not to it, but she died of a heart attack but while she was having treatment for breast cancer. So um, it's very in- interesting for me, the parallels between that moment and the trauma associated with recovering and the shock to my body and the shock to the system, how I was moving, what the world felt like, and how I'm, how I'm coping with what's going on in the world today. Because this pandemic, I mean, I saw a beautiful quote that said, um, you know, we all talk about, um, this isn't my first rodeo, right? Yeah. And someone said, um, may not be my first rodeo, but this is my first pandemic. (laughs) And I like that because it really is, it's, it, we need to be so tolerant of each other right now that, um, there's so, we just don't know how we're supposed to act. We don't know what we're supposed to be doing. Um, many people are just quiet in this moment, absorbing what's going on in the world. So there are lots of parallels between what I survived then and how I survived it. And I didn't really, I wasn't as well prepared then, I guess, as I am in this moment because, and probably I know this through a lot of the trauma sufferers is, is some of them are actually better prepared for this because they've been through trauma and they know how to survive something. And and so, trauma prepares you for trauma. Right, right. You, you know you can survive it, right? If you if you you really focus and you and you do all the things that you're supposed to do, you can you have a much better chance of surviving it. So we already know that, right? So um, it's interesting to me. It's like um, uh, I think I said something to somebody, and they said, um, "But would you be prepared to shut it down or, or stuff?" And I said. I cut pieces of my body off. I amputated part of my body so that I could survive. I don't think I'm going to have a problem saying no to that. Yeah. Because you do, you learn a whole other way of being, right? You, you, I'm prepared to do something so drastic 
that's small compared to that. Absolutely. You learn in an instant that your, your life can change completely and you learn to live yeah. like that. And it's not the first time. And that's yeah. stopping drinking is very different, but stopping drinking or using drugs is you make a decision in the moment and you stick with that and your life changes completely. You have to find a new way to live. You right. have to also find a new way to live. Right. And, and you know that you will survive this. You that's know a, that if you really focus on you and you, and you, and you pay attention to stuff that's important, you will survive this. Well, I think even, and, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, no. well, yeah. Uh, okay. I'll go. <laughs> this happens all the I'm time. Old, I'm older than you. If, if I say and you interrupt, I've forgotten. Oh, okay. So, sorry. Wow. Okay. <laughs> and I've forgotten. Wow. Um, <laughs> The, the thing is, even, uh, you know, talking about in terms of the pandemic, the, the thing for me is even if one doesn't survive, yeah. you, you live your life knowing you've done your best. You make decisions right. based on self-love and self-care. And you understand yeah. that we are not that powerful that we can control the outcome. We can do everything right. within our power to control the outcome. And that's even, even if you don't survive, you've survived. Because I think not you running. posted something right at the very beginning of all of this about anxiety. And it was around mm. that. It was focus on the things that you can control. Focus on the stuff that you have influence over. Um, that's it, yeah. And when you asked me what I wanted to do a podcast on, I said I didn't want to talk about just any old thing, I wanted to talk about something that was useful to people because there's so much out there at the moment, right? Um, that it's important to, um, to, to share some of the things. Something, something just hit me. Um, you know, they did this thing in the newspaper. There was somebody who shared something about um, how much we have valued doctors and things suddenly their value in the world has gone shot through the roof yes and people that we're not valuing are people like artists and things like that and what right. we're just saying now like if you don't survive this pandemic if you have survived this pandemic and you haven't seen a nurse and you haven't seen a doctor and you haven't been on a ventilator you've been entertained by an artist the artist Absolutely. has been looking after you. How many people have burned through Netflix and they've burned through stuff? I would argue that the doctor and the nurse and the artist are just as, as powerful. Whether you're the BBC or an actor putting on a show in his in his guard in his in his in his dining room. I think yeah. It's interesting how the world's perspective is just so I think it's we, we start to gain value for other people. I know it's a big thing oh. in South Africa where I'm seeing people greeting shop uh, the, the the shelf packers in the shops uh, and the, yeah. the the tellers and saying thank you. You yeah. you're also a frontline worker. You're working really hard and exposing yourself and putting yourself at risk. I only have to come to the shops once a week or once every two weeks oh. or whatever. You're here all day every day, and because you're here. I'm able to feed my family without anxiety because I know like, at the beginning of this pandemic and the most valuable thing in the world, well, the commodity was toilet paper. As a matter wow. of fact, I paid my rent for two months in toilet paper. And because <laughs> 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 when you don't have it, it gets quite expensive. The, the value increases. And, um, but, but, you know, it's like suddenly like we can relax about going to the shops. There's stress, there's queuing, there's sanitizing, but this has all become the norm. But if it wasn't for those people, so I think, I hope that this has taught us to value everyone and that, that everyone has a tremendous uh, value. You know, even driving into the parking lot at the supermarket, the, the parking is far emptier. So you feel anxiety around, oh, my car's more likely to be stolen, but there's still the two or three car guards there. And again, standing there and exposing themselves. So saying thank you to them, to our Uber drivers, to our, you know, the restaurant staff, the staff that have to take a taxi to work. Um, we're starting to realize more the value of, of everyone around us. At, at least that's what I hope. So in terms I've of been, 
I'm very clear that in this moment, I'm looking for the, for the helpers. Anyone whose function or what they're doing is helping, I will, I will support them, I will celebrate them, I will illuminate them, I will amplify whatever it is that they're doing and give them whatever I can because they're important. They're important. The people who are helping. So, so somebody who's suffering anxiety and that sort of stuff, I will help them. I, in that space, I will become a helper. But I won't, you know, what I mean? like it's a, a sort of a moment where I love the people who are helping. Anyone who's doing is helping. If you're packing a shelf or if you're just uh, taking food to older people, if you're making sure somebody's being fed, if you are, I know several South Africans who are taking money out of their own pocket to support people that, like you say, that you encounter literally in your day-to-day -day stuff. So yes. I, those are the people, people anyone who's helping are, should be really looked after. And I, I think that's a wonderful way for people to calm themselves. Um, I know it's been, you know, right. I spent, right. yeah, yeah, I, I spend very little time on social media because of the anxiety and the panic and the stress. And I see people stressing about things like alcohol and cigarettes. And I just want to scream at them, well, what you were going to spend on alcohol and cigarettes, go and feed your neighbor who has lost his job. These are the kind of things that I want to yell out. But I, I made a decision early on in this that I was limiting what I was putting out because so many people are putting out. There's so much going on that I think people are overwhelmed. But in terms of just realizing, like walking into the shops and going, I didn't, realize, I didn't even see the shelf packer before this. But uh, now I realize he exposes himself or herself every day and I can feed my family because of them. Now I see a far more value in a person. And I'm just, I'm speaking genuinely. I mean, I, I like to greet everyone. Um, yeah. you know, that, that's part of how- It's how hard I, in the mask, right? It's hard <laughs> in the mask. Because yes. people don't do eye contact the same way and stuff. So I'm yeah. also, I'm like you, I go out of my way to make mm. sure that somebody sees me, even if it's from six feet apart, but yes, you know, I try. Absolutely, a hundred percent. And that's it. And it's like, I can deal with my stress by realizing how many amazing people are out there doing things to help all of us. I think maybe what yeah. this has given us is the opportunity to see how valuable each of us are a cog in a wheel, um, yeah. you know, and, and that's the thing. So uh, we do, uh, we, I, I do a lot of training with the addicts at Houghton House. I have a friend of mine, one of my athletes, Simon, who helps me out on a Saturday. He goes through and does that as service. And he's not getting paid yeah. for it. You know, yeah. just, and, and, and the guys are so grateful that someone's coming to give of their time. You know, the yeah. ability to do for another without expectation of anything back. For yeah. me, yeah. I believe that's one of the greatest ways that we can add value to our lives. Yes. And improve, and our, improve our quality. My, my mom, my mom um, used to have a lovely expression. Um, and sometimes when I use it, people are kind of concerned about me. But she, she had an expression <laughs> that said, stop pondering your own navel which is as soon as you start paying too much attention to the stuff that's happening to you yes you're gonna you're gonna get that anxiety and and um depression and and sadness and everything's gonna be oh woe is me because i'm not getting what i need whereas if you focus on the outside and, and i'm not suggesting you ask people to see their navels but if you start focusing on other people and yes. their stuff Yep. You're going to go, oh, okay, well, let me help. Let me step in. Because I think fundamentally, most of the people that I know are people who would like to help or do step in and do engage. Um, uh, you know, and you brought up some, some interesting points. Um, you know, I, I do think you're right about social media. I've seen a lot of people that I know on social media just withdraw um, because it's not healthy for them and that's very good. And that comes yeah. into what we want to talk, what I want to talk about today, which is self-care, which is self-care is really good boundaries around stuff that isn't going to help you and knowing when it's not helping you and you need to be able to say, okay, we're done. We're, you know, this is going that side and I can't, I can't listen to everybody moan about, you know, Clorox or um, not having cigarettes or, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, 
So I think having those natural boundaries and setting them up is very important. And something else that you mentioned about the alcohol and the cigarettes and stuff in South Africa was it really is, these are both things that, that people have become reliant on in such a strong way. Yeah. Um, I attended a webinar um, of a South African business the other day and I was quite surprised because it was posted at 4 p.m. South African time and it was, it was a business webinar and every bar one person that spoke, everyone that spoke talked about what they were currently drinking and then showed the glass of wine or cocktail or right. whatever. And then also talked about what parties or drinking experiences they'd all had together at some point or whatever. And I thought to myself, I thought, you know, um, first of all, in America, life is a little bit different. People are very professional here. You wouldn't have that space. That wouldn't be um, something that would be done, especially if it's an outward broadcast. I mean, I'm not yes. saying that you can't have social drinks with your colleagues and things like that, but as an outside broadcast, you wouldn't be sitting there with the, with the sense of now we're all going to have a nice drink and things like that. It would be much more professionally hosted. But then it made me think we've often had conversations around this because you are a recovering addict and alcoholic and yeah. um, the, the level of awareness around alcohol in South Africa, you know, when you're buying pineapples and sugar and yeast to get or, drunk. <laughs> or, or when your supermarket is actually putting them on a single display. Making a special display for you. I think there's a question, there's a, and I think we can see it now, that they allowed alcohol to be sold and now there are emergency rooms are filling up again. because people And, and rehab centers. And we have sent it's amazing to see the, the growth in that, just the inflow, yeah. So for me, self-care, so, so this is how it sort of layers. So when I, when I went into surgery for my breast cancer, I made some decisions around what were the things that I could influence, what were the things that I could do that could help me. Right. And one of the things was I instinctively think that my body responds better or heals better when it's not exposed to sugar right and we know that alcohol is a sugar right and yep. all carbohydrates everything else these are all sugars and things. And so what i did was i actively and and intentionally for about a, a month after before my surgery and about a month after my surgery actually six weeks after my surgery decided to stay off um any kind of alcohol or things and it wasn't like doing dry january and it wasn't those things i didn't miss it I had pure intention around why I wasn't having it. It was okay. It didn't affect me. I wasn't, you know, desperate for the next um, right. drink because it was about honoring myself. And so self care is moments where you're able to say, I'm going to deal with the stuff that I, that I have maybe a potential issue with. Do I have an issue with alcohol? Alcohol affects everything. So self care includes, I need to sleep better. We all know by now that alcohol is actually a stimulant. So if you're having a couple of dorks at night and then you're wondering why you're not sleeping so lacquer, yep. you, you can actually, you can think, oh, okay, hang on a second. Maybe if I stop drinking for a couple of days, I might get a better night's sleep. And even if you do sleep, your quality of sleep is not as deep. It's not as good. It's not as beneficial to you. Well, I, I think we had this conversation. I um, because the medication that I'm on with my with my breast cancer stuff, um, tamoxifen, I've got to be on it for a few more years. But one of the things is that I can't really drink anyway. I mean, I'm, it, it's depressing in a way, but it's also not because I know it. I, I accept mm. it. If I have two two drinks, my resting pulse in the morning goes from fifty six to seventy. Right. It's a 50% sure. increase or like a 40% increase in my resting heart rate. So that means while I've been trying to sleep, my body has just been working at a higher level the whole night. That's, the, that's my, my resting heart. So I know the effects of it. So, so self-care are hard questions for yourself. What are your, what are your boundaries? What are the things that you need to start drawing a line around? 
means stepping away from Facebook and having the courage to not be as engaged and not go on all the time and, and stuff. Or ring fence it. You know, there's a lovely function on Facebook where you can snooze people for 30 days. So if you know somebody's agitating you, you just snooze yep. them for 30 days. They don't know. And you know. They'll never know. Uh, that's it. Because I think we used to use Facebook as a distraction and now it's yeah. become our main source of reality. And it's not a pleasant reality yeah. that we're seeing, which is, which is the problem. You know, I think we, we were talking earlier about anxiety. Yeah. And for me, what I've learned is actually anxiety is my superpower. Because anxiety yeah. is, for me, how I perceive it and how I see, see it with other people, it, it's heightened awareness. And when you were talking about focusing on your navel, you know, if you look right. in all of that awareness and focus and attention, it's like saying someone with anxiety has their focus and attention and sees what 10 people would normally see. So it's a lot of information. And yeah, when, yeah, yeah. when you focus it internally, that's where it builds and it become, can become very destructive. When you focus it externally, looking for, say like, I want to bring good into my life. I want to yeah. see good things. That's what you do. Yeah. Um, and then you can see opportunities to bring good things, uh, good experiences, good moments into your life. So I think that it really is a bit of a superpower. So I love the analogy of, you know, don't focus on your navel because you're just going yeah. to create a loop um, of anxiety and yeah. Of stress. Yeah. And it's not that anxiety can, as you say, it is a superpower because it, it forces you to go, hang on. I need to do something about this. I need to step in. I need to, because self-awareness, we talk about this often. Self-awareness is, is so key because self-aware people rarely do harm. Yes. If you're anxious and you're focused on your navel, you're not really worrying that you're going to hurt someone else or you're making decisions that are around, I need to fix stuff for me. I'm not. And I'm now. Not yeah. Yes. It, it so, shortens your long-term horizon. Yeah. yeah. And you can make some really crappy decisions, right? Absolutely. You, and we all know that. So, um, so self-care is, and it's not something that, I mean, I, always, I used to joke that self-care um, is never a bubble bath. And then and then, some point during this pandemic, I actually had a bubble bath and I went, oh, actually, sometimes it could be. It could be a bubble <laughs> but, bath, yeah. <laughs> can be. But, um, but self-care really is long-term investment in your wellness and your well-being and taking responsibility for the stuff that you do so so i i i, I joking because i i do this thing where i do vision boards every year and i love doing vision boards with people it's one of the most exciting things because you really drill down to people's core understanding of what it is that it takes to get them where they're where they're at and i actually i i i said to somebody the other day in one of my coaching sessions i said you know who i blame for the pandemic like, oh who do you blame and i said i blame all those people who stuck mindfulness on their vision board Right. Because okay. this is the moment, right? Yep. The globe is saying, whoa, we will all reset. When did yep. you ever think that the world would actually say, stop? When did you ever think that would ever happen? And yep. so we have time for mindfulness. In right. fact, putting that mask on every time you go out is the biggest act of mindfulness that you can do because you are protecting yourself by protecting the other people. Right. That's it. It's an act for others. You have to think twice about going out and doing something because is it worth doing that? Is it, you know, we, mm. it's, it's the mm. biggest moment in the history of certainly my life of we, a global mindfulness moment. But even, even being mindful of what we spend money on and how we spend money. You know, going, well, I'm yes. going, do I go out for two burgers? And that's uh, 200 Rand. As an example, 200 Rand could, has been able to feed me for the last week. So maybe I should stay home because I don't know when I'm going to get back to work. The, these yeah. are the kind of things, yeah. So do you have a list of these people that, that we could contact? And, and <laughs> <laughs> It's everyone, right? How many yep. people do you know who said, oh, I wish I could be a little bit more mindful? Like mm. everyone, right? So um, uh, one of the other fun things that always or usually happens on a, on a vision board is somebody will say, I want to lose weight. And then I'll say, okay, but that's interesting because what does that mean to you? Because um, 
what do you want to do? Oh, no, I want to lose 20 kilograms. And I say, okay, well, we can do that. I can do that for you by tomorrow. And they're always surprised, right? This is like, you, you make yeah. what? You, you know, change my life. And I say, yeah. we take your knee, above, just above the knee, and we cut that off. And then right. you do the kilograms down. So you need to be intentional around what it is that you mean by weight loss. Because mm. it's very easy for people to set themselves up to fail. Because you can start at the beginning of the year and say, I'm going to lose weight. And then by the end of January, you've lost nothing. And you haven't even stuck to dry January. And you haven't done all those things. And so we let it go. But the intention right. around wanting to lose weight is that you want your body to feel different. You have some health issues. You are, you are investing in a future version of yourself. Um, and I don't mean this. It's got nothing to do with the aesthetics of this because right. for me, weight, weight is not about aesthetics. You know me. I, I yep, say 100%. The, definition of a, the definition of a beach body is a body on a beach. I yep. don't, you know, you know, bikini body is a body in a bikini and they make them in every size. So, you know, I, I'm not worried about that. I'm worried about what, you, what it means for you, what that health or that weight loss means to you. Because if you start out and you don't know why or you don't know how or you're not, planning for it correctly and you're not nourishing yourself in the right way. You're not ex exercising self-care. You're ex exercising punitive stuff. And every morning that you step on the scale, there's a, 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 a compound in your head that mm -hmm. says, you know, look, you didn't lose again. You're, you're, you're useless. You don't know what you're doing. Um, you know, and eventually you're going to stop wanting to hear that. So you give up. And so, I, I think it's, it's so what I understand you saying is, the the desire for weight loss must come from a healthy place in order and to take you to a healthy place so the start point should be health and the end point should be health well it's also it's self-care mm -hmm. yeah and the minute that it becomes about an aesthetic that's less self-care that's more pondering my own navel because i'm anxious because i don't look like this how many people do you know mm -hmm. that say oh i'm not thin enough to date someone or yeah. I, you know, I'll find love um, when I've lost 20 five kilo. Yeah, that's it. It's like that no. number. Yes. And that's got nothing to do with it, actually, because it just doesn't. Um, and so the minute that you're in that space where you're going, it's about how I want to look to someone, it isn't really self-care. It doesn't fall into self-care. Yeah. Self-care goes, I eat the food that nourishes my body. Does that mean you never eat the Chelsea button? No. Because sometimes you also need to nourish your soul. And, and now and then a Chelsea bun. And now and then a, you know, I don't know, what's, what's your, you know, like Cheesecake. peanut butter with chocolate. Yes, yes, Cheesecake yes. yes, or, yes. Or those things. But if you are mindful and you're also nourishing your body, you're going to go, you know what, I'll have one piece and I'm okay. Because now I know I've, I've done that. Or, you know, yeah. or you know, okay, I don't know. But you're aware of it. But uh, it, it is, it's when that desire is coming from a healthy place. I mean, I, I had a friend of mine, Reese, give me an entire cheesecake for my birthday. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying that he came to drop it off because that would have been illegal. Uh, but he had but it, it delivered. But it happened to be at your house. It happened to be at my house, yeah. And it was the most magnificent cheesecake I've had. It was like creamy on top and it was unbelievable. And I had an entire cheesecake in my in my fridge i think if i'd said wow. I, I see this with a lot of the the girls and quite, quite a few guys in recovery where they are heavier and they're okay. like all all fit actually no any shape and they're right. all but they're like because i train the addicts and they're like okay great i really need to lose weight i need to get into shape i need to do this and i just say to them you need to love yourself and you need to understand you're lovable irrespective of what you look like. And the blood drains out of their face because like I go straight to their soul and it's like, how do you know this as well? Because I've lived it and you know, I see it all. You're not, you, they're not unique in this and people are, are, are destroying their bodies for an aesthetic that is unachievable. And, and that's when it's as you, from an unhealthy place. And if I had that sort of mentality of I can have a small piece of cheesecake and, because I'm going to get fat, and then I would end up scoffing the whole thing. Yeah, Where yeah. If I know that I can eat it whenever I want, 
I had cheesecake for breakfast for two days. And on the third day, I was like, mm, it's too much. Done. Yeah. You know, and, and I gave, I gave a third of it away, you know, which made me feel good. So that's, yeah, it's, it's, you know, health and being optimal and being able to put in the hours and have the energy to live your life and having the vitality to live your life. I mean, that is crucial. Yeah. How do you, oh. you used an interesting word. You, you said when people come and say they need to do something. Yes. And in my, so if I say to you, I need to drink a cup of coffee with you tomorrow. Or I say, I want to drink a cup of coffee with I'm, you I'm tomorrow. moving slowly out of frame because you've said this several times to me. I'm just going to be over here. <laughs> no, no, no. But if yeah. I say those yeah. two things, and I use yes. the word need, and I use the yeah. word want. Yeah. These are two totally separate concepts. Absolutely. I say I need to have coffee with me tomorrow. You feel like, oh, okay, is there something you want to talk about? Is there something mm. specific? If I say I want to have coffee with you, you're going to go, oh, that feels nice. Actually, yes. yeah, I'd also like it. And so I think sometimes this need comes is always an external thing. It feels right. like an external drive. I need to be skinny or I need to be this way. I immediately know that it's not something from within. Right. Or, or maybe it's, it's an in, a need is the word need indicates an inability to cope with what you're going through. So it could be, I need to have a cup Explain of coffee. How you would, okay. I'm have, I, I need to have a cup of coffee with you because I'm having a really rough time and I find talking to you helps me clear things in my head. So I want to have a cup of coffee with you because it's like awesome hanging out and we need, I want to but get I would. Out. You could still say, I want to have coffee with you because yes. I like your perspective on something and I'm struggling mm. a little bit. No? True. Yep. Okay. Um, 100%. Yeah. I, 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 I try to get people to reuse or re reframe how they look at something. You, 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 you're good at the reframing. I like reframing. Yep. I like reframing. I think that would probably, that's my superpower. Yeah. That would be my superpower is that... Um, so when I amputated my breasts and moved forward through life, I didn't go, oh, woe is me, and this is awful and stuff. I called them the 2.0s, and I made sure that they had a lot of fun. And okay. so, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like, and because, because of my ability to reframe, I sat down one night and I was thinking, because of course you're afraid, and of course there's stuff that goes through your head, and you are. Yes. I was terrified, right? And I'm sitting there, and I'm I'm trying to understand how I'm going to deal with the fact that my body's going to be so different and so changed. And I was lying there, and I thought, you know, through your life as a woman, your breasts have been so many different versions, right? They've been different sizes, they've been different shapes, they've been different, you know, from puberty through to breastfeeding two children, there's a shift in my body that I then went, this is just another one of those shifts. Right. But it's a whole upgrade, right? We threw out all the servers and we had to buy new ones and stuff. So, so they became version 2.0. Okay. <laughs> Excuse me, Chuck. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> no, you can. And, yeah. and I happily talk about it because I do think, especially in the breast cancer community, mm. people don't always talk about it and it's fine because I mean, my mom had it. No one was allowed to know that my mother had breast cancer. Okay. And she had it twice. It came back. No one was allowed to know. She didn't want to tell anybody. It was very private for her. And I completely understand that. So um, um, I talk about it because I can talk about it. And I can right. be... Um, overt and, and, and a little bit silly and, and, and more fun because I do want the message not to be just doom and gloom and, and horror and things. Um, but it's real, you know, it's not, not real, but yeah. So I, I laugh about it. I, I joke about it. There are days where it's, it's, it's not great. I mean, we talked about, yeah. um, you know, during this pandemic, one of the things that I've had to focus on in my self care bucket is I have to take a medication every day and if I skip it, I go through puberty <laughs> right. within a 24-hour period, followed by old lady syndrome. Right. Like, so puberty and menopause within 24 hours of each other. And sure. this is not lacquer. No. Um, either one of those is not great. And so I've had that four times. 
in the three years that I've been on this medication before, I think I missed it once. Sure. So, because do you know if every day is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday now? Mm. Not so much. Yeah. yeah. I, I've even What's stopped. Yeah, no, I've, I've even stopped. I've stopped worrying about the time. I, you know, I no longer go to sleep at 10 o'clock. I go to sleep when I'm tired. And yeah. the, the, so I might know what day it is because I have an appointment with a client, but the yeah. days and time have lost their relevance. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's another it. thing yeah. in self-care for people is pay mm. attention to the mm. stuff that needs you to be more vigilant. And there are lots of people who are living on all kinds of things, you know, whether it's an antidepressant or it's a heart medication or it's something that makes sure that, you know, your life has a certain quality to it. Pay special attention and use whatever whatever mechanics you have. Mine is I now have one of those little old lady pill containers that's next to my bed and it sits on the top. M T W T F S S. That one. Actually this starts it starts S M D. S M T. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. So, right. Yeah. And and I put all my vitamins and supplements into it so that I know, you know, everything's covered and things. So right. self care is really putting prioritizing the stuff that that minimizes you being anxious about other things. And it's, and it is, it's exposing yourself to, to sunlight if you can, because that's one of the tenets of sleep. So yeah. foundationally you need better sleep. Yes. And we're all not sleeping very well because we're paying attention to the noise that's out there. We're reading a lot more about the pandemic or something, or somebody sends gifts or memes or things to keep us entertained. Or the, We're looking at our phones a lot more. We are, getting a lot of LED stimulation. Yep. Um, there's a lot of stuff that, are, that our more brain has to try time, and switch yeah. off from, more screen time. And you need more sunlight, more real sunlight mm. if you can. I mean, obviously some, some places it's not so easy. But get more real sunlight earlier in the day will help you sleep better at night. Right. Um, what were the other things about sleep? You need, we all know, that optimal, I mean, I love the South Africans who were running little mini half marathons in their, in their apartments and things. I just thought that was so spirited. I really, you know, it's like saying, you can't hold me down. Because yeah. Nelson Mandela and his crew lived in a very small space and they exercised. They made sure that they exercised every day. So my, 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 one of the most important things that you can do for self-care in the moment is, is that significant movement every day and what what's significant to me is 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 irrelevant to you it has yes. to be significant for you and and just and that's it. it so it's it's about doing more focusing and becoming aware of the things that are better for you and avoiding the things that aren't so do, doing uh, doing more of the things that help you and are good for you less of the things that hurt you that's what i i say to the addicts that i work with Become who hang around who you want to become and yeah. avoid who you don't want to be. Yeah. And that's it. So seek the feelings that you want and avoid the feelings that you don't want. And I, I don't mean like by denying emotions and denying feelings, but you know, if you know that Facebook is going to make you anxious and upset you and it doesn't really, or any social media add value to your life, avoid it. Or as you said, 30 yeah. day, those people, you know, yeah. I love, it. I'm going to try that. And, um, and, oh, and you can also switch off all the ads. Yeah. So, you know, who needs to be reminded every day that you don't have the money to buy the freaking pair of shoes that looks amazing? No, you see, I, right. I like the ads because it just, it just, oh. remind, it, because it makes me feel good. It makes me feel special because it just reminds me that Google is listening to everything and that Facebook is listening to anything like our discussion with Monty Python and in my YouTube feed, they were, I mean, not my faulty towers. There was the exact clip we were talking about um, on an application owned by Facebook. Anyway, <laughs> <There you go. laughs> at least yep. I know someone cares enough to market me what they think I want. So, <laughs> and it's useful if it's something you really want. That's it. Yeah. So I think, so, yeah. Something I'd love to chat about is just the vision board because I think okay. now is a perfect opportunity for people to vision board may, how they would like their reality to be now and to vision board where and they want to be after this. So absolutely, because now we're in this moment where we're going, what's important? 
And how many conversations have you had with people that have started with, well, when this finishes, when this is over, <laughs> I'm going to... No, no. The, and the I love that. Are usually, no, no, I, I can't hear you. No, no, it's at uh, uh, the bottom on the left. On the, 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 no, <laughs> you turned your camera off. No, no, that's, sorry. I couldn't help. That's true. Those are the conversations we're having, right? Other. Yeah, absolutely. I am loving, I am loving that we can have conversations because prior right? to this, if I'd said to a friend, let's have a Zoom call and they were on the other side of the planet, they would have gone, mm, no, not really. Or yeah, yeah. that's a bit weird or stuff. But now everybody's talking to everybody all over the place, which is really fun. So, it's wonderful. Um, so those, that's a lovely question to ask yourself. Like, or, you know, what mm. would you get a tattoo of? If you could go and get a tattoo that, that was to say what you achieved in this moment or what you were thinking or what was important to you in this moment that you would take with you forever, what's that talisman that you would carry? Um, what, sure. what do you Beautiful. want? What's the first thing you want to do when this all finishes? When somebody says global pandemic finished. And then why weren't you doing that to start with? Right. Let's dismantle those barriers and really start saying. So, for example, somebody might say to you, I should have traveled the world. I want to travel the world. Mm. And then you go, the, the point of a vision board isn't just to stick a picture of the globe and a big airplane and say, okay, that's it. The point of the vision board is that's great. Mm. It's a lovely goal. And how are you going to achieve that? Because we know, one, you're going to maybe need a little bit of money. You're going to need yep. at least a ticket that goes all around the world. You're going to need to feed yourself. So are you going to go to places where you know with whatever password you have, you can do a couple of jobs or something so you can feed yourself as you go, all those things. So you start to make a real strategic plan around what is the passion or the interest or the thing that you have. So that's the turn, point turn, of the vision. Turning board. a dream into a goal. Correct. Yeah, right. And, okay. Fantastic. And dreaming as big as you want. Mm. But then, like you say, planning for it, because what, what I'm sure it's the, you know, those business screw uh, things, you know, uh, failing to plan is planning to fail. Kind of right. Thing, you know, all that. Mm -hmm. so, so you want to have those things. The other thing I want to ask people, and, and I think it's one of the nicest things that you can do for somebody. Um, if, you, if your house is on fire, <laughs> stick with me. <laughs> your house is on fire yeah, yeah. And, and you could only say three things now we're going to assume that all your photos are on a hard drive and then everything backed up and so on find me three things in your house that you would never ever want to lose right so what's important to you what are the core values that you hold that you would, you would keep with you. One of my clients said, first, they always go to the photos, take all the photos of my grandchildren. And I said, okay, but let's say that everything's on a, on a, on a, on a hard drive and mm. oh, saves yeah. the cloud and That's it. it's all safe. Yeah. And then he said, he went deep within his head and he went, oh my God, you know what I would, love, what I would say is my grandfather's rose cutters. Okay. And I said, Tell me about them. And he and his grandfather had the most amazing relationship. He used to walk with his granddad around the garden and they used to prune the flowers together. And he learned how to prune roses and take care of his garden through his grandfather. And when his grandfather died, he inherited the rose pruners, the, right. the cutting. And he's had them re um, sharpened, mm -hmm. he's had the handles redone and everything else. But they are, when he uses them, he is channeling this great man who taught him so much. And right. so his values attached to that right. are family and um, generational, intergenerational stuff. Um, he's, it's beautiful. And so I would challenge people to do that. Find three things in, in your world that you would want to save from the fire. That's unbelievable. Then w what, what do they do with that? Put them somewhere safe. Okay. <laughs> Put them somewhere where you know you can get them. And, you, you, and know you them quickly, yeah. And honor them with what it is that, that's in that moment. Like that man didn't know. He didn't have that. He didn't make the connection as to how important it was that he was using his grandfather's yes. cutters. So I drew oh. that connection to him. And I sure. said how valuable this thing is. He hadn't attached mm -hmm. a value to it till that moment. Right. It's only, for me, the, you said, what's the first thing I would do once this is over? And uh, yeah, oh, I, nearly, I actually nearly started crying.
Because the the first okay. thing the first thing that I would do is give my dad a hug and yeah. put my arms around him and just feel my dad, give him a hug, give him a kiss oh. and smell his hair because my dad has a certain smell. Uh, he said, and, and that's what I remember from a kid because I have my head on his shoulder and I might be 49 and he's in his 80s, but he's still same smell, you know, and it's that nurturing warm. We spoke about the blanket, you know, for me that I would say, yeah. you know, I've got the two yeah. and um, it is like my dad bought me this amazing blanket many years ago and it's been with me down to Cape Town and through all of my difficulties and challenges and that's it, you know, it keeps me warm at night. Um, which yeah, yeah, is absolutely yeah. wonderful. So that the, those are the things, and I'm just looking up. I have two amazing paintings of my grandfather, or from my grandfather. Yeah. So those are pretty much what I would take out. So I'm taking four things. Sorry, that's fine. <laughs> you know, the blanket. That's fine. Yep, that's and the fine. painting. So that's it, it. Is it's just it's sometimes like I suppose and it, that comes from the experience of you know of going through difficulties um, when you know firstly getting sober. And then having lost in, in Cape Town, just getting wiped out financially. Um, we yeah. moved, I moved down there with a the firm that I was with and I just, I couldn't operate uh, financial planning or insurance and I couldn't operate in the Cape Town market and I got wiped out. I didn't earn an income for eight months yeah. and I lost everything that wasn't of value. And that's what you learn. Like I had my car which was valuable because for me, it was a means of getting back to Joburg. I had my pillows, my clothes, my blanket, and yeah. I came back to Joburg like with very little. And, you know, I had friends that were kind enough to give me an apartment to stay in. Oh, your video has gone. Sorry. No problem. Hello. Sorry. You get a call. <laughs> but, I, oh. I had my do not disturb on, so I'm now here. Okay. okay. Um, so, yeah, and like just, you know, came back to Joburg and, I had these incredible friends that helped me rebuild my life, giving me a job, giving me, um, you know, I started training with one, uh, another one of them in an apartment, all of these incredible things. Um, I actually had a face on, pace, uh, a face on Facebook, yes. A post on yeah. Facebook, wow. Um, a post on Facebook today, which was a memory. And it was from, I think, 10 years ago or 11 years ago. I, I was homeless and my friend Ian gave me a, an apartment to stay in. There wasn't a lot of furniture in there and he lent me some and I rearranged some of it. Just a desk and a chair and uh, I didn't even have a bed. I slept on the floor for eight months and uh, because I, didn't, I was so grateful for getting the apartment, I didn't want to tell him about the sleeping issue. And a friend of mine, Robbie, gave me a, a foam mattress, like a camping mattress to sleep on. And I don't think anyone understood how, how rough it was. And like, those were some of the richest experiences of my life. So when it, yeah. it, it's, it's sometimes losing everything except what is important, except what is valuable. And you understand that all of these things are not valuable. I'm sitting here looking at my camera, my, my screens, you know, these things are yeah. amazing, yeah. wonderful tools, but they're, they're not the essence of, of life. They're not the essence of being. Um, if you said to me, give up all of this right now and you can have a, a two minute hug with your dad or in a heartbeat, oh. you know, and, and, and that's what I want because it's like killing me. Uh, the, the, this is the, this is the hardest thing for me in my life. And that, that sort of, I, I understand that and I understand what the reality is and I get to speak to him and I get to, but you know, it'll be nice to go for breakfast and give him a hug because that was us. That's been our Saturday ritual for 10 years. Um, which is really cool. And there must be so many people who are missing that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like just as it's important for you to give that hug, it's probably just as important for him to receive it. Um, no, usually every time I try to give him a hug and a kiss, he tells me to go and find a girlfriend. And if we're with oh. people, he'll say, can't you get a girlfriend? Now, he loves them now, I know. But it's just, he's also from the non-hugging, touching generation. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, there's a, the five languages of love, and sometimes... You know, physical touch isn't one of them. Yeah, absolutely. That's why he, he I mean, carries a taser. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Dad, can I give you a hug? Put the pepper spray down. Yeah, I love you, so, man. Come on. So what yeah. we were talking about, I mean, when we discussed, when you told me about the blankets and things, and I gave yeah. you that reframe around what those blankets actually are. Absolutely. Right? You didn't know that until we did that. Yep. You didn't, or you, I mean, you might have known it, you might have felt it, you might have had some understanding of it, but it had a deeper value attached to it when you went, oh, yeah. okay, that's 
that's, that's it. And it is. It's like getting a hug every night, you know, and sleeping yeah. in the arms of my dad like I would do as a kid. So absolutely. Yeah. And and telling someone to expect or to say everything's gonna be burnt to the to race to the ground. Yeah. I'm gonna find the things that are valuable is kind of doing that. It's it's obviously yeah. without the extreme of stripping away their whole lives and devastating them. It's saying to them, what are the things that you really think are important in the world? Yes. And that you would want to take with you. That's it. But it's, you know, and I lived that. So oh. it, it means a great deal to me. It's like when I left Cape Town, everything that I owned fitted in my car. And that was my laptop for work, my clo some clothes, toiletries, uh, blankets, and pillows. That was it. Everything I owned and I moved, it was every, all that I had to, you know, when I came up to Job, I, I look around like I've accumulated a lot of stuff um, yeah. <laughs> in, in, yeah. in that time. But the other thing that also meant a lot to me is I'm, I'm getting quite, this is the most personal I've, I've ever gotten on one of my shows. So, but it, it's kind of cool. Um, I'm well, surprised you haven't yawned yet, just saying. But. I've yawned three times. I've been hiding it behind the pop filter. <laughs> <laughs> Our conversations are very relaxing, and I tend to <laughs> no, no, those are it's also it's wonderful. Um, the talking to you is very calming, um, and that's why I was very keen to to do the show. And um, it, it was kind of cool that I carried a lot of guilt and shame around buying things uh, when in 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 recover in sobriety. Because I bought a lot of stuff I didn't need, uh, you know, seven series BMW, three piece suits, um, dumb stuff, dinners, cigars, you know, fortune on alcohol. And the, I carry still shame around having bought stuff. And this is the gift of being sober for over 13 years now, I'm coming up on 14 in October, sure. Um, the, is the fact that, I look at stuff like that I've bought and it's like, wow, it is valuable because I'm actually using it now. So it's like certain yeah. things that I had acquired in my life that I, I hang on to and like they're now useful. Um, so I know there's a big minimalism movement in this world. And it's like, well, if I didn't yeah. have them, I, you know, it, it's nice also to find that balance for yourself and not stick yeah. to too many rules. And I think that's what also people uh, need to understand. And I, I posted something. I had a memory come up on, on Facebook this year, which was really cool. Again, today I had some really good memories come up. Um, you know, uh, some from uh, uh, some photos from my, my wedding, which was a, also a wonderful reminder of that because it was an incredible time in my life. And um, just also from trying to see if this, uh, if I can find it, just from the past. And I think what I wrote was along the lines of, I have lived my life following uh, most of my life following other people's rules. Yeah. And, and it nearly destroyed me, which it did. Um, trying to make my grandparents happy, my parents happy, my mother happy, you know, just my, just trying to make my mom happy, trying to be loved by my mother nearly killed me because that's what yeah. led to my drinking and all of these things and it's like it's our life it's our one opportunity and we have to learn to live it and maybe people yes. are realizing it now that you know we have one life and we need to we need to live it that way we can't look for um making other people happy because other people's ha we're not that powerful yeah you know there's a there's one of my favorite people is dr victor frankel and he wrote a book he was in the mm. concentration camps and he wrote a book, um, Man's Will to Meaning. Search, so, man's Search, search for Meaning. meaning. Search, yeah. search for Meaning. And, um, and his um, logotherapy basis is, we have two lives, and the second one starts the moment we realize we only had one. Sure, yeah. And that's this moment for, for a lot of people, is, is them saying, what if... What if this is all I have? And this moment is saying, sometimes what you, the things you think are important are not important. So what yeah. are you gonna do next? And you're absolutely right. A vision board at this moment would be, what would you really like to see? And that's not to say that, so I did a vision board at the beginning of the year 
and it was full of lots of things. One of the things that I, I don't think I'm going to be able to achieve, and that's not because I'm trying to be pessimistic, is I wanted to swim a mile in under 40 minutes. And I just, I don't have a swimming pool that I have access to. And right. I don't have, I mean, outdoor lake I could do, but I don't have immediate access to one. And some of the ones that are local are, are packed full of people. So yes. I'm just not So, um, but every day I still find things on there that I look at and I honor in the way that I reframe the world. Right. So I put, I wanted to spend a lot more time with my family on there and boy, am I ever. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, I, you know, what's it, we all part of this generation where we have like multiple careers. So we have these, yeah. the slash, the slash careers. So I've gone from like, um, XEO, executive coach, life coach, uh, homeschooling mom, <laughs> hairdresser. I added dog grooming to this two weeks ago, you know, and you keep going through and, and stuff. So, um, so I've, I've spent a lot more time with family and it's how did I honor that in a way that still stuck to what it is that I wanted to achieve from that moment. And it's right. been quite lovely. Career-wise, there was stuff I wanted to focus on that I'm then able to reframe because now suddenly people are prepared to have a conversation with you all the way around the world. So I'm now coaching all around the world. Right. So these are things that are interesting. So yes, absolutely, a vision board right now, even if the world isn't exactly as you imagined you want it to be in 365 days, you will be able to use the stuff that you dream for yourself in a way to get there. Absolutely. It, 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 I mean, it's been, I have to be very careful how, how I phrase this. Okay. You know, for me, this time has been an incredible gift because one, it's allowed me to take the business online, which was a dream that I had put off for six years. You know, you, you're so, yeah. you're so, but, you know, you're so busy building a business, paying staff, yeah. all of these things, you don't move in the direction you want to. This forced us to move. And I, I want to say that this is an incredible opportunity for people, firstly, to realize how resilient they truly are, how capable they truly are, that mm -hmm. they've gotten to spend time. This is a generation uh, that, you know, my friends with young kids, you know, older kids that are at home spending time with their children three months of seeing them for most of the day. That is a gift as, as, as challenging and dramatic. I'm sure it has been because I'm very fortunate. I haven't had a homeschool anyone, but you know, that's an incredible gift, but I need to be very careful because people are starving. People are losing their jobs. People are, you know, and, and I don't want to be the raw, oh, raw, oh, look, look at the, look on the bright side. Yay. Because mm -hmm. there are people going through incredible challenges now, like unable to feed their families. And so you have to draw a balance there, right? You yeah. have to, because I know you help people. I know you mm -hmm. do. And I know that you are, are working out how to help people in the right way and, and, and which people, deserve, you know, are, are going to get help from you. Um, there is a balance. We need to keep hope. That's always important in a, I mean, that's, that's, the t that's one of the other functions of the will to meaning is you've got to find your purpose and your meaning, the, the thing that's keeping you alive and keeping yes. you driven. Um, and I think we, we distilled this is that you, what did I say? Sometimes I say some smart stuff and then I yes, forget you what do. I said. Yeah. Um, I said that you help people understand that their strength comes from where they've been broken. That's yep. where they've been broken and that's where their okay. strength can come from. Th that's the goal like used that. to fix the, the porcelain. Like the Kintsugi, Kintsugi mm. bowls. So you, but that's, that's exactly what you do. And in this moment, people are very aware of where they're broken and where things are breaking. And so you're helping. So that's not necessary. I don't know that you should feel stay humble, but know that, for example, the Houghton House stuff you do, or the yeah. rehab stuff you do, that's you giving it back and saying, "This is this is. I know where you are. I've been there. 
And I know that it's tough even more so now. And I'm right. benefiting in this space, but that affords me to be able to come and do this for you. So I don't, you know, I think your, your balance is right. I don't, that's the important mm -hmm. thing. So, Thank so you. I volunteer coach nurses, families, because they're on the front line. And their families right. need support. And, and, and sure, and absolutely. She started visiting the world. But I, that's volunteer. That's free. That's not. Right. No. Um, is the, that's service for me. That's not. So, so there's a balance between it's great that it's in benefiting that I am actually able to do other stuff and charge people. And see it. But then there's this clip where I can feel like I'm giving back to people. That's, and, and it's so important, you know, that's, that's another group of heroes that also need to be acknowledged, the families of the, the, the frontline yeah. workers, the first responders. Yeah. Um, because the guy who's packing the shelf in, in, in pick and pay, yeah. his, his family are all at home also at risk of exposure because he's at work of what he's bringing back absolutely yeah. and so your i mean your doctors you're not I'm sure um there's a there's a group i follow on on facebook called humans of COVID 19 set up by uh one of my i'll call it one of my athletes benji rosen so it's one of the doctors yeah that came to South Africa to do his trauma training. And a lot of the guys train with me at the gym and we have a special deal for our foreign docs. Um, and we, we busy, we train a group of them now and that we don't actually charge for it as well because yeah, yeah. It's just our way of giving back. And the, the, he started this group and it's amazing because he just, it's a photograph and a short write up by these first responders. And one was a police woman. And like she said, the hardest thing for her when all of this started was understanding that she may have to choose to leave her family, leave her husband and leave her kids because she's exposed all the time while they're sheltering in place. And does she bring that back? It's like, yeah. do my job, which I love. Um, I'm needed, but yeah, I have yeah. to stay. Do I go home or yeah. do I keep my family safe by not seeing them? And like, because they're at the highest risk. Looking, I mean, the packer yeah. has one level of risk, but they're at the highest risk because yeah. they're with them every day. Yeah, that's it. And, and you know, those are the, the those are the people that also need to be applauded and valued. And you know, and and we just we need to be grateful to them as well because they're carrying the stress of what they do all day, seeing this this disease and this death. And when I read what these guys are going through, when I read what they say, I understand the severity of what we're actually going through and the seriousness of this disease, um, the, this pandemic. And I look at it and I, I, I'm quite curious because I'm going to post this on YouTube. So I don't know what uh, it's, uh, <laughs> you know, the rules are in terms of mentioning COVID, but, uh, Oh, I said, it. Uh, maybe, maybe we'll get taken off. Who knows? We'll see. Uh, if it does, I'll just edit out, the, you know, cause I, a lot of people are going, the situation. Yes. <laughs> so, oh, really? Uh, yeah, um, absolutely. Um, we'll find somewhere else to put it. But I mean, I can understand that they don't want to create chaos and misinformation. And, yeah, right. misinformation. That's it. So, yeah, it's just that I think we're just seeing how amazing people truly are. And sometimes maybe the, the way that people can help themselves is shift their focus from the things that cause them pain that cause them stress, government, corruption, politicians, all of these things. And understand that like, you see a police being a sure. I wonder if he's home with his family or if he's staying at the barracks and making that sacrifice. Maybe I could just, right. I'm not going to ask him. I'm just going to go up and say, thank you. Or the fireman, the police, the, the shelf packer, you know, just go and say, thank you. And it's something like, it's an amazing thing, smiling and, um, I forget his name. He's a really good, also corporate speaker. Um, he just said like the value of saying thank you and smiling. Um, it's been shown scientifically that like, it increases your, your feel good hormones. Your yeah. dop you get a dopamine. Yeah, 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 yeah. The person you give it to gets a dopamine hit and they radiate that and the people they encounter. So that's the, the, the chemical value of a smile. 
Um, you know, let's start a dopamine pandemic by smiling. That's not a bad Here thing. Here we go. Smiling, what did smiling I say? with okay. our eyes. Yeah, you know, all those people with the crow's feet are going to get even yeah, worse. I, um, I, I always say a smile is a currency with an exchange rate that's incalculable. Absolutely. And it's the, it's the exchange rate of the smile because when you smile at someone, they, yeah, that's it, exactly. Um, you know, and I think that's it. You know, we can start a dopamine pandemic. Maybe that's what people can take out of the show today. Um, so there's also so dopamine and serotonin. These are two things that people. So I I know some people oh, and, who, are, yeah. mm. who are weaning themselves off antidepressants and things in this moment because they're thinking, okay, let's not cope with that. But yeah. then you've got to find natural ways to support your serotonin and your dopamine. Now your dopamine's your quick fix stuff, mm. and your serotonin mm. is the stuff that builds up over time. Yes. and that's that's exercise, and that's taking care of yourself, and that's you know body awareness, all those other things. Mm. That you see. On and, yeah, uh, hydration, meditation, and hydration, and all of those things to keep mm. that serotonin at, at a level. Dopamine are the quick fixes, like you know, jumping mm. out of a, a plane or something like that. Yeah. But that's that's also oh, smiling at night. someone, smiling <laughs> at someone, or, um, playing a video game or something like that. That you really, mm. you just dad really jokes. Really nice. I think. I'm not sure about the exchange rate on that one. I'm not sure about the exchange oh, rate on the, do- on the day. I tried. I tried. Okay. <laughs> yeah, this is true. Um, <laughs> I think this is the longest I've ever yep. spoken to you without a dad joke. Yep. Um, okay, give me a few minutes. I'll work on it. Um, <laughs> We, we spoke um, just before we started recording um, about sort of, you know, we touched on it briefly, alcohol and alcohol consumption oh, yeah. in South Africa. Um, you know, for me, I've just seen it, how, especially early on when they, they shut down alcohol, the rates of alcoholism in our country and alcohol dependency is, is huge. And I think people are starting to realize it, but they've gone straight back to, to their drinking. Um, and the one, the one thing that I always like to to tell guys in recovery, and I, I you know, I, people say, well, can't you have just one or two? And there's two answers I yeah. give. You. The first is, one, it changes my, my I'm not, not thinking as a sober person anymore, and I make all of my decisions in the present. But, and I think what what we've spoken about is our coping skills. When you use something to help you cope, that's external you deprive yourself of learning how to cope Mm. with it without that external help. So if you Mm. drink to relax at the end of a hard day, you're depriving yourself of the ability to learn to relax without drinking. Mm. And I think this is the big thing that people like, yeah, but you know, I need to have fun. I need to unwind. Well, if you're using alcohol for that and you need it, then you're depriving yourself of the ability to unwind relax and have fun maybe going for a walk or just talking with your spouse or your partner yeah. or a friend so you know on on zoom and yeah. and that's yeah. the big thing i think alcohol deprives you of developing coping skills and you know nick it's it's pervasive isn't it it's everywhere so you turn on the tv and and they've got they've taken away smoking on some shows and things like that. You can't see people smoking. You can't see certain behaviors, whatever. Mm. But in almost every single television show or or movie or something, there's alcohol placement. And people, the first thing they do, something happens, they go straight to the drinks cabinet or they go straight to the to the, to the bottle. And I think what's happening is we really are becoming so much more accepting mm-hmm. of the fact that. Oh, something went wrong, or something's happened, or I'm like you say, the coping mechanism is well. Let me just go and fill up a glass rather than right. um, how am I actually facing this? What's going on for right. me? And, and identifying what's going, what's really happening inside of you in that moment, or spending time doing it in a different way. So I think what's happening is there's a, it's it's permissive, it's 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 everywhere, it's reinforced by behaviors. Um, I mean, all the cool people have brands of whatever, you know, yep. like The Rock just brought up tequila and George hey, Clooney yeah, up until recently yeah. had some tequila, you know, yep. all, and Ryan Reynolds, most delicious yeah. tequila. Okay, cool. Most delicious, <laughs> you know, it's the only thing of George Clooney's I've ever liked. Okay, so, fair. Well, you also did so, an espresso. 
Yeah, I don't like that. I'm not oh, like anybody okay. that only that forces you to use pods. Uh, you should be able to do reusable coffee. Mm. So, um, so I think um, awareness, this is again what we were talking about, is self-awareness around your relationship to alcohol and be real, really understand it, be real. And dependency on it for certain things. And, and um, is it... Russell Brand is one of them. I love Russell Brand when he talks about addiction and stuff and he's got like the 12 steps, but his 12 steps aren't the same as the Alcoholics Anonymous um, stuff. Mm. He's like, well, how effed are you? Right. And can you un yourself? Yeah. Okay. So, so the first thing to do is to understand what is my reliance on this and why am I so engaged with it? And am I actually capable of fixing this for myself? Right. My argument would be if you've ever tried dry January and you've stopped two thirds of the way through, probably not. My my argument would be if you've ever tried dry January, there's a problem. Yeah. 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 Maybe. You know, the thing is that as you like, you you get home and you get stressed and and this brought back a memory from my childhood, um, which I'll talk about now, but you get home and you stress and you go straight and pour a glass and sit down and drink it it deprives you of the ability to go, I'm going to sit down and try and understand what I'm feeling. I need to access those feelings. I need to feel because we're afraid of feeling. Uh, that's why we, we drink. We don't want to feel. We want to be numb. And we don't want to have to deal with it in that moment because we've got so much going on. We've got so many things going on and we don't want to deal with it. But the reality is the more you deal with it, the better you get at dealing with it. And then you realize that you're capable of dealing with a lot more than you thought, that you're capable of, of carrying a lot more than you thought, mm-hmm. processing a lot more. Um, it's like lifting weights. You know, if you want to lift more weights, lift weights until you, you know, lift more weights to lift yeah, more yeah. weights. The, you know, there's two things that, that have come back to me on this. I remember um, growing up watching, watching Dallas. And they would always come back, you know, before dinner, they would always walk in and in their suits and looking very spiffy and go to the bar and pour one another drinks. You know, in jail. Oh. And I remember when my grandfather died and I came back um, to the apartment in my suit and I thought, yep, that's it. That's how I'm going to deal with this. And I went straight and I poured myself a giant whiskey and I turned around. I was the only one in my family because no one in my family drinks. And I was the only one drinking. And I was like, well, whatever. You know, as opposed to going and sitting down and saying, guys, I'm not coping. I'm just going to go sit in the spare room for a while. Please excuse me. And just sit and have a cry yeah. and feel what I needed to yeah. feel. You know, that's the thing. It, it takes that away from us. And people are going, well, my kids are driving me mad. I can't cope. I can't, you know, do 30 push-ups or 10 push-ups or sit mm. or do something or speak to your partner or if you're on your own, you know, when the kids are asleep, sit in bed and have a good cry, but do it yeah. in a way that you are present because when you're present in dealing with pain or difficulties, you gain skills in dealing with pain and difficulties. Yeah. Yeah. And, f- um, and the, the best decisions are not the easy ones. No. Yeah. <laughs> I had this discussion today with a mutual friend of ours yeah the best decisions are not the easy ones mm. um and we as humans like you say we try and avoid that so yeah. we start the negotiation process with ourselves you know maybe i don't have an alcohol problem and i'll just give up alcohol for january prove mm. to everybody i can do it and then yeah. you know big accolade because i can do it but then you still have that relationship with yeah. you you never really fix that um um this, I had a I had a conversation recently with someone same thing, um, where we talked about um, the relationship they had with alcohol, and they said they they described exactly that when they would come when when their parents would come home when their mother would come home, and she needed to speak to them. The mother would say, "Give me a minute," and she'd go and pour mm. herself a drink, and then sit down and say, "Okay, now we can talk." And it's like. Yeah. <laughs> So you're learning already in that beha- in that in that world. That's your learned behavior. Yeah. You know, this is always just stuff that you yourself can just unpack. Um, you know, as Russell says, you know, can you unf yourself? That's <laughs> is, it. Is 
is is powerful you know there's there are well, people who are trained and qualified to be able to do that yeah it's one of my my mentors and that's what i love about technology we've never met in person we've had very few conversations but the advice that he's given me has had a profound effect and it's mark twite who started uh, jim jones the the gym that trained the guys from the movie 300 that's sort of how i found them and that was started my fitness journey and he said un f your head no that's it it's that simple just un your head and it's amazing or, or your mind but i like that you know yeah. and it's because yeah. sometimes we do we stand in our own way um just on what we were speaking about uh, a quote i'm just trying to recall who it was from it says the quality of your life is determined by the number of uncomfortable conversations you're willing to have and that's with yeah. yourself and with others and yeah uh, that, that's the big thing we i i hope the the banning and the unbanning of the alcohol has brought people a little bit closer and a little bit more understanding in terms of their their dependency on on the substance i just see within the rehab center how it's packed now and it was like people realizing like sure yeah i bought um, i bought alcohol for three weeks and i drank it in three days you know this is the kind of thing it's a, that anxiety and that panic and that and there are a lot of sober guys out there who have been in the program that have not bought alcohol and have sat through the exact same thing and have just dealt with it a little bit better or a lot better because they're sober wow. You know, sure. that's, that's it. Sure. We, go, we, we have to go through pain in order to learn that we can go through pain. That's how resilience is, is made, right? Resilience is not something you are gifted. It's mm -hmm. earned. It's, yep. it's a continual process of I felt pain. I went through this. I survived it. I can face something again. You know, it's like the elastic band. It, doesn't mean that it's not under pressure and that it isn't in pain. It it will survive that move, you know. Yeah. Um, sure, I love that. Resi um, resilience is earned. Always. Yeah, it's earned in resilience. Yeah, it's not a, you know, it's, uh, when someone says to you, "How can you be so resilient about something?" It's mm -hmm. not. It's not. You know, I went out and got it off the shelf or I watched a TED talk on it and now I know <laughs> it's something that you really do have to experience and it comes in different forms, but yeah. Absolutely. Sure. That's power. I think I, and th that's sort of where I'd like to, to leave it for tonight. Um, okay. It's been unbelievable. Or, or sorry for, for today. Uh, what it's, it's what quarter to quarter to three for you. Quarter to two, quarter to three. Yeah. <laughs> Three, wow, time yeah. flies. <laughs> it's been awesome. Uh, we can do this for hours and hours. So I would love to have you back on and um, I oh. will nag you about it constantly throughout the week. So um, I, I want to come on. I want to come on. Um, um, Michelle, Michelle, she was, yes. she was with me. Absolutely. No, that, that, that's something definitely uh, that I would love to do. Um, that's going to be fantastic. We'll also have to get you a body by Emmett Sash. Uh, with the Diamante, so oh, I'll, I'll, I'll have a chat with my ex-wife. So she made it; it's absolutely spectacular. Michelle has worn it on the beach with her oh. beach body. So yeah, yeah, very very cool. But yeah, it's just um, the um, one of my gifts from from this pandemic has been the ability to vir virtually spend time with you. And um, yeah. you, I, I, I love our conversations, and they've been um, they've, they've been of huge value to me, and have made a difference in the quality of my days. And I just wanted to thank yeah. thank you for that. And I can reciprocate because the reason I reached out and said hi was because you're one of the helpers. And right at the beginning of this, I went, I want to pitch my my. What do you say when you're doing something? I want to. I want to. Join anyone who's a helper. Yes. And support and encourage and so on. And so that's why. That's well, thank why you. I'm well, I'm, I'm very glad that you did. Yeah, it means a lot. So thank you very, cool. very much.